I can't wait to introduce you to my friend and guest today, Paul Moore. Welcome to the show. Hey, Chad, how you doing? Doing well. Good to see you. I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person. I'm just I was going to fly up. from London this morning, but the, you know the, the, they were all booked up. That's a stupid joke. I'm right down the road from Chad. Yeah, so we're very close. I'm at my place in Roanoke, because you guys know. But I really want to introduce you guys to Paul, because he's a great example of Someone who, you know, I, I don't even know how to introduce Paul. He's a realtor. He, he's an investor. He's a fund manager. He's a philanthropist. He's a father. He's a church leader. He just, oh, an author. I forgot you're a, you're an author too and a Bigger Pockets host. And Paul has a very interesting story that we could never pack into one episode. Paul, uh, how do you introduce you? I just, I don't know. I'm at a loss here. So did you, I'm, I don't know, I'm not mad or anything, but you didn't mention builder. I, uh, I built seven or eight houses at Smith Mountain Lake. And I want to tell your audience, here's a writer downer. This is the most important thing I might say today. If you don't know how to change the doorknob in your own house, you probably shouldn't be a builder. I'm just saying that's just really important to know. Yeah. Paul, it takes a long time to even digest the, the scope of, of his experience. So we first started meeting for two-person mini masterminds back in, yeah. I think it was 2012. And we would be like, all right, half an hour, half an hour, hour one cup of coffee. Two hours later, we were sitting in a coffee shop. Well, at least. Uh, I really wanted to give you guys an opportunity to see what it looks like when somebody comes out of residential real estate into investing and brokerage and actually runs at a higher level while serving everyone around them at a higher level, not giving up on their clients, not leaving their clients to fend for themselves, but showing them how to work less, earn more, and do good in their own lives. Paul is the best example I can think of, uh, of doing that. So Paul, thank you for taking the time to do this. We talked about some of the risks in residential real estate and Fed in particular has a, a I would say an ultra high net worth buyer who said, you know, find ways to spend my money, like make me spend money. And he's busting, you know, busting his butt trying to find single family homes and deals and medical centers and things like this. And I think you certainly understand exactly what it's like to be in the trenches competing for the few deals that are actually deals and having your investors, you know, rely on you. So tell these guys a little bit about your story, like what led you from, from kind of the, the world of residential real estate, investing in brokerage and building all the way to where you are now and, and, uh, what advice yeah. you might have to others. Yeah. So I sold my company to a public firm in 1997 and moved to the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I tried to start a nonprofit. I did start a nonprofit organization reaching out to international students studying the U.S. because we found out that 80 or 90 percent, there's an actual, I think it's like 93 percent even of the students who spent an average of five and a half years in the U.S., international students, that is, never set foot in an American's home. So we tried to give them a Blue Ridge Mountain weekend experience, you know, where they could milk a goat and ride a horse or ride a cow and milk a whatever. Anyway, we had a lot of fun, but I got bored pretty quick. I was 34 years old, high energy entrepreneur, type A. And so started flipping houses and went from flipping houses to flipping lots at Smith Mountain Lake here in Virginia, flipped dozens of houses, dozens of lots. Uh, got my realtor's license because I didn't want to leave all that money on the table, right? And then we started doing lease to own homes and did a lease to own a brand new home thing that didn't work. Cause I told you, but anyway, uh, but did a small subdivision, but over the years, Chad, I was wondering how do I get involved in commercial real estate? Because I don't think I realized how much this was true, but I realized at some point that the Forbes 400, the wealthiest people in America, almost all invest in commercial real estate. I didn't know where the on-ramps were. I went over to Towers Mall and I got the name off the sign. And I actually called the broker on that sign. It turned out it was actually the syndicator. And he explained syndication. Well, I had grown up in the 60s and 70s and syndication sounded like a godfather thing to me. It scared me. But uh, no, seriously, he... He, he told me about syndication and it didn't seem practical to me. Well, I kept thinking about how to get involved in commercial real estate. I ended up doing an oil and gas deal. I had a petroleum engineering degree in the 80s and I did an oil and gas deal in the North Dakota uh, Bakken. 
and found out there was a massive housing shortage. So my friend Barry and I set up a beautiful quasi hotel, quasi multifamily asset in North Dakota to house oil workers. And our goal was to be the last one standing. There was all these man camps, RV parks, and people were really miserable in these things. So we built the nicest log cabin community we could. And we did it in a matter of a few months, literally from buying the land to opening our doors was a few months. It was crazy crazy how fast we were able to do this. Didn't you develop broadband internet at the same time to serve that community? Can we not talk about that? Okay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I had a, I have a podcast called How to Lose Money. And uh, that was one of our topics because uh, we, we did wireless internet at the same time to serve the communities around us and the man camps and the RV parks. And we spent basically six or eight years losing money until we finally shut that down. And we also did a Hyatt hotel. We did the nicest Hyatt house in America, to my knowledge, in Minot, North Dakota. And anyway, I was thrust into the commercial real estate sector and I thought, huh, what? I, I don't know if I want to, like the building experience, like I joked about earlier on the show, it just didn't feel like me. And so I wanted to get into class B value add. And I remember I was standing in my library talking to you on the phone and I said, have you heard of 37th parallel? And you had, and you even knew their first names. Anyway, I went and mentored under them for a year. And then I wrote a book after that with, I mean, cause I'd already operated the, the cell, the, excuse me, the multifamily quasi hotel. We were charging by the way, 4,000 a month for a 300 square foot room. And that sounds horrific. If it's multifamily, like how could you dare charge that much? But as a hotel room, that was only $129 a night. And the hotel rooms in the area were going for three and 400 and they were all booked. And so it was really a decent deal for oil companies, you know, who were putting people up there to drill these very high dollar wells. But uh, at any rate, I ended up writing a, a book on multifamily. It was a humble title called The Perfect Investment. And I really thought that that's all I'd ever do the rest of my life. But and I told my wife, no more shiny object chasing for me. Well, about three or four years into this new multifamily realm, I we just beat our head against the wall looking for deals. And it looked like everything was overpriced. Sounds familiar, right? And it's it, relative to the year 2014 or 15 or 16 or whatever, everything was highly overpriced. It's actually worse now relative to 2021 than it was then. We can talk about that in a minute, and I think we should. But I finally said enough. And we turned our attention to self storage, mobile home parks, and now we're even looking at the industrial space. And so I'll take a breath and see what questions you have from there. And then we can launch back into that history if you want. I have a hard time recapping. I think the way we met is my, I think we both share the same opinion on brokerages. So we chose an indie broker that actually trusts us to do the right thing and doesn't micromanage or try to make us recruit. And when my broker got to know me, it was, I was brand new to town. She's like, do you know Paul Moore? And I'm like, nope, don't know anybody. He just moved here from Hawaii. She's like, you got to meet this guy because Paul had done so much, like such a diverse skill set that he had collected. So thanks. Thanks for recapping that. Um, what's really interesting to me and why I think you're valuable in this community is the, the clarity that you got that actually led you to serve clients at a higher level. If I'm supposed to be a fiduciary to these investors, to these buyers, what am I supposed to do in a market like this? And that's what those conversations that Paul and I had four and five years ago in good conscience, we couldn't tell our best investors. These are, you know, you're, well, especially in this region of the country, but like your reputation, it takes a lifetime to build on one deal to completely burn and take all of that progress, all of that momentum and pivot to do what was right for the, for the buyer, for the investor, for the consumer, because his, his reputation is important. So I think that's what I want to talk about next. Like if you're a real estate professional in this environment, um, especially if you agree that asset prices are, are falsely inflated because of a lot of monopoly money in the system. And that money is some of it's printed, some of it's, you know, junk debt sitting on the fed balance sheet. But if you believe that these prices aren't, aren't particularly driven by like anything other than federal reserve intervention, and you can't in good conscience put buyers or investors into those deals. 
that's kind of the position Paul found himself in all the way back in like 2015, 2016. And that led his career to a different space. So Paul, I'm curious if you can catch them up on that part of the story and kind of what advice would you give to someone in residential real estate that is working with both accredited and non-accredited investors, what can I do? Yeah. So I want to hit on a couple things. First of all, I want to talk about the difference between residential and commercial. And then I briefly want to tell you about that pivot and why. So if I bought a house in Roanoke for $115,000 and I actually went in and I put in like, I finished the attic, finished the basement, added on, put in beautiful fencing and just like made everything top dollar. And I added $300,000 to that house. Now I'd have what, 400 and let's say 50,000 in it with transaction and holding costs. But if that was in a $250,000 neighborhood, I'm probably not going to get my money out of that house because residential Real estate, as we all know, is based on comps. It's based on what else is in the neighborhood for the most part. But commercial real estate is entirely different. It's based on math. Now, your mama always told you to do good in math, and this is the reason. It's for this one formula. And that formula is the value of commercial real estate is the net operating income divided by the rate of return or the cap rate. And so if you can increase revenue and decrease expenses, you're going to be able to increase the net operating income. And if you can find a way to hold the cap rate steady or even shrink it, it's going to massively, potentially, significantly increase the value of that asset. You sprinkle in a little safe leverage and it makes it even more. And so this is why I love commercial real estate. And I think this is why most of the Forbes 400 is in it. In fact, it's likely even in a situation like you talked about on Tuesday, where, you know, they're going to increase the interest rate by, you know, 20 basis points. And they've talked about what increasing it several times, by the way, I think that talking about increasing the interest rate, what is it? Five or six or seven times. I think they're trying to scare inflation away. I don't think there's any chance they could do that. As you said the other day, I mean, you know, they, they, they are, I think they're trying to scare inflation away and it makes sense that they would. It's exactly what I would do if I was in their horrible shoes. But at any rate, it's possible to drive appreciation, the NOI of that formula, enough to way outrun the cap rate. So if the cap rate goes down, that means the price goes up because it's the denominator, right? If the cap rate goes up, in other words, it, let's say interest rates go up and cap rate goes up as well, then the price of the asset shrinks or it goes down. Well, it's possible in certain asset types to have the NOI outrun the cap rate. And here's how. Invest in mom and pop owned assets. Now, Michelangelo, are we talking about sculpture now? Yes. Michelangelo said that when he looked at a piece of marble, he could see an angel inside. All he had to do is chip away the stuff that's in the way. So we could see that angel. That seems odd. Well, it's the same thing we find in commercial real estate. There are assets that have tremendous intrinsic value. It's like Warren Buffett's talked about for 60 years, finding intrinsic value buried in an asset and extracting it. And so rather than calling it value add real estate, let's call it intrinsic value extraction, where we actually pull out the latent value in an asset. And so by doing that, we can increase the NOI, the the numerator of our equation tremendously. And if cap rates even go up a little, the value will still go up. And it's basically a way of protecting your downside. There's so many benefits to thinking this way. Buying from mom and pops is powerful because they don't have the desire or the knowledge or the resources to increase income and maximize value. So quick example, February 20th, uh, a week before COVID hit the, I mean, the very top of the news and the stock market, our operating partner closed on a Louisville mobile home park for 7.1 million. He had five objectives without going into detail. He hit about three of the five objectives in about six months, and he knew it would take him about three more years to hit the others. And his goal was to get it to a $14 million value. Now, with only three and a half million dollars in equity and three and a half in debt when he started, getting it to 14 million from seven would be a massive grand slam if he could do that in five years. I mean, who would have dreamed he would get a $15 million offer in six months? So he sold the property and had a 347% IRR. Now, I would argue 
that he might have made a lot more money for investors just by holding on five or 10 years. And that's another story. But the point is, he was able to drive significant increase in net operating income because he purchased it from a lady who had not visited the park in over five years. We're talking about a $7 million asset. By the way, before this big run-up in cap rates and in asset values, that part might have been worth $3 million. So for her to get a $7 million, she was pinching herself and she was thrilled. And that's my point. She didn't need to be a great operator, she could go on being mediocre and not visiting the park for five years because cap rates alone gave her a massive boost in value. But by taking this mediocre park and turning it into a great park, he was able to more than double the value in a year. Well, even if cap rates significantly increased, his NOI increased so very much that he was able to outrun that cap rate, if you will. And that is a way to prepare for a downturn. So we love buying from mom and pop operators and mom and pop operators are very few and far between in multifamily, but there's a lot of them in mobile home parks and self storage and certain types of light industrial. You say we bought, we this, we that, tell them who we is. Yeah. That's where I cut off on my history because I thought I was being too long winded. But what happened is when we decided we wanted to go into self storage and mobile home parks. Wellings Capital, my company decided, wait a minute, we don't have a team. We don't have a track record. We don't have a good acquisition strategy. We proved that in the multifamily world. And so we decided it'd be best for us to partner with the very, very best operators we could find in self-storage, mobile home parks, and now light industrial. And so what we did is we believe, you know, the 80-20 rule is fractal, as Perry Marshall says. 80-20 of 80-20. So in other words, the top 20% of the top 20% of the operators is what we're looking for. We're looking for operators with phenomenal track records, great downside protection, careful leverage, great acquisition teams, lots of character, lots of history. And so we partner with them. We put together a fund and we're finishing up our fourth fund now, Wellings Capital, where we provide our investors with a diversified group of assets from different operators, different geographies, different strategies. And so one investor can put a hundred thousand with us and it might be spread across like 78 different assets in 20 states. So that's what we do. You know, it's funny as I trust you so much. I don't even know which of your funds I invested in. I think it was uh, the income. I think it was the growth fund. Actually, I took that money and went to, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you yeah. went in the Wellings <laughs> Income Fund 1. We're finishing Fund 3 right now, which is our fourth fund. So looking at prices and the back end of our financial markets, I decided to liquidate my residential real estate holdings and move into what I saw as safer asset classes for what I thought would be a coming financial crisis. This was all the way back in 2016 that I started to move things off. It's amazing to me that, that the U.S. dollar has, has, has made it this far with this much momentum without right. having to pay a price. Like it's been fascinating. Those guys for... all with their hands on the controls are brilliant. I mean, they may be evil or they may be good, but they're brilliant no matter what they are. Yeah. So I started liquidating, uh, thinking that, that the other shoe had to drop soon. And I was, so I was sitting in cash looking, I'm like, what am I going to buy? So I start looking at mobile home parks. Um, as I was looking for assets that, that would kind of back test through the last recession that only gets stronger. And Paul and I had one of our weekly mastermind calls and he's like, you're never going to believe what we're doing. And that's where they were making the pivot. So I actually jumped in, I think it was, was it January of, what was that, 18? I think you jumped in in January, 2019. January of 19. Yeah. For me, I'll just tell you guys, like you heard me give advice on what alternative investments you can push your, your really good residential guys into. For me, I saw significantly less risk investing in a value add commercial fund where, oh, I, I, let me back up. I was, I was almost dumb enough to go buy my own mobile home parks and I had, oh, I remember stuff. that. And, uh, I actually turned down an opportunity to, to buy a deal that looked like a home run in Georgia. It was two parks in Georgia to, and I was like, just take my money, Paul. 
And I'll tell you how much, how active I've been to make the return that I have. I've done absolutely nothing. I don't even remember which fund I invested in. So for me, you know, gaining accredited investor status and having the ability to go down to Georgia, do my due diligence, dig into a mom and pop trailer park, you know, figure out how to do the value add to turn around the ops, all that stuff while still trying to, to travel six and eight months a year and meet my personal goals, my lifestyle goals. It just didn't make any sense. What made sense for me was to give, give money to Paul and let him go make three times more money where I do nothing. The hurdle there for me was reaching accredited investor status. So I, I invited Paul here because he kind of did this with his own career. Later, I started to invest in what he was doing because I trusted it more than what I could do independently on my own. Um, and the, what I want to talk about now, Paul, that we kind of got some context. I know who you are and, and where you've come from. Like, what, what, what advice would you give to a real estate professional, whether they're an investor or in brokerage? If they're working with buyers, and some of those buyers are obviously going to be better capitalized than others, what would be your advice? And if they're coming up on overpriced assets, multiple offers, all the frustrations, looking out, out of market, out of state, and them, everyone's going to the Midwest trying to find deals for their California buyers. But if they're, if they're coming up against those walls, like what advice would you give for alternatives for a real estate professional, whether they're licensed or not, to take their most trusted relationships, their buyers, if they're non-accredited investors, what do you recommend versus if they're accredited investors? Great question. So I have an honest conversation with people about this quite often. I had a, uh, as an example of one of these conversations, I was talking to a, uh, an oral surgeon from the Pacific Northwest, and he was excitedly telling me how he was building a 20 home portfolio to replace his income so he could retire. And his wife is an orthodontist and she was going to keep working. And he was telling me about the homes he was acquiring and his strategy. And then he started sighing and he said, yeah, but I'm uh, talking to painters between surgeries and I'm screening tenants in the evening. I don't know how sustainable this is actually. And I'm only on house number three. And I said, dude, why are you doing this? How many, how much are you making per hour doing this? And he honestly, he, he took a hard look and he said, you know what? I, I probably shouldn't be doing this. And you know, here, here's my advice to everybody. And, and I know I'm being very opinionated and some people on bigger pockets don't like me for saying this because it flies in the face of a lot of what they believe. And I spoke at their conference on Tuesday, but I, I, here's what I believe. I think you should either be all in 100% all your focus. You know, we talked, you know, Jay Papazon, who actually took the mic from me uh, and spoke right after me at Bigger Pockets on Tuesday. Either Jay, you know, Jay Papazan and Gary Keller talk about the one thing, and almost everybody knows that concept now. So you either do the one thing really, really well, or you go to the other extreme and outsource it really, really well. I don't think it makes sense for most people to have a main gig and then a side hustle because the side hustle becomes another half-time, full-time job, typically. I know there's many exceptions, and I'm going to tell one in a minute, but for most people, it's very, very draining. And it turns out that usually most people do neither really well. And Gary Keller hammers that point. And Jay hammers that in their book. You know, you can't do two things really, really well. Something's going to suffer. It might be your health. More likely it'll be your marriage or your relationships or your relationships with your kids. I mean, God bless Elon Musk, but I've heard he doesn't have a great relationship with his wives. I say that with his wife or his kids. And you know what? I mean, I don't want that. I want him to have a better life. And I think maybe he needs to focus on what, well, he's not going to listen to me, but I want to listen. Your audience might listen. I would just really, really focus and do really w well on one thing or outsource really, really well. But I would not do some half-hearted like, yeah, I'll flip this on the side or I'll do this or that on the side. And that's why Wellings Capital is in business. We're here to do the due diligence that our investors would love to do if they have the time or the knowledge or the resources, or if they were willing to fly across the country. Now, if you insist on investing with somebody, well, I mean, if you do want to throw yourself into my second option, 
which is outsource really well. Get Brian Burke's book and you, you should have him on your show, Chad. He'll be glad to be on. He's a friend of mine, the hands-off investor. It's like 300 meaty pages on how to do due diligence on sponsors. I mean, go out and read this book and go find a great syndicator or fund to invest in, or even start that yourself. But I wouldn't do it on the side while you're working 50 hours a week at your tech or medical job or your real estate job. That's one thought I have. Any thoughts on that before I jump into the accredited, non-accredited and all that? No, I'll just underscore that. I mean, I have looked at, God, at this point, probably thousands of pitch decks from sponsors. I always underwrite the people first before I even, before I even care about the asset. Who is yes. the sponsor and how distracted is he or she? What is their day job? And if it's not their day job, I'm out. I'm gone in the very beginning because, you know, all the way back 3000 years ago, Confucius can be traced to say, oh man, you know, chase two rabbits. The man who chases two rabbits catches none. And so to underscore your advice, like you don't want to put your clients in investments with right. sponsors who, if it's their, and it, Maybe it's not fair to say if it's their first deal, that's not a good underwrite. Like that's right. not, he could have been part of a hundred deals in another fund. And this is his first that he's sponsoring, which is kind of similar to Paul's situation. When I first invested with you, it was your first private offering, right? Like it was it our first your, fund. It was our third or fourth private offering, but our, th yeah. our first fund, right? First Etsy, like first, you know, syndication. And for, but I had no doubt. I'm like, yeah, I know the people. So I, I would say, you know, when you're presenting opportunities, whether it's Wellings Capital or other funds or, or syndications, when you present opportunities to your clients, to your customers, to your friends, to your family, to anyone who's looking to invest passively, make sure you underwrite the people first and then the yeah. deals. Cause if you put the right people in in the in the right seats that you they won't come up with bad assets they'll come up with value add assets right. and, and and structure deals creatively and extract as much profit yes, as possible yes a great short. a great operator can fix a mediocre deal a mediocre operator can ruin a great deal yeah and unfortunately we've seen that too we won't mention any names we don't want to ruffle to any feathers um, no but can i tell you a story yeah i can do this in seconds this week I was with Brian Burke at Bigger Pockets and he told me that he had a mediocre apartment deal and he was not able to raise the rate, the rent on this for three. You know what? I'm not going to finish that story. I don't even know if that's public yet, but it, let's put it this way. Somebody's buying his apartments uh, for way, way too much money. I talked to another friend of ours, uh, AJ Osborne, who was telling me that he had uh, bid $75 million on a portfolio and somebody, and he said that was straining him right to the limits of his self-storage portfolio. Somebody else came in much, much, much tens of millions higher. And he said, there is no way that's going to go well for those investors unless inflation just overwhelms that. And, and how are they even going to get debt? How are they even going to get make that work? But anyway, he, he, he just could not believe. And people are, folks, this is happening left and right now, not just in single family, people overpaying, but especially in multifamily and even in other places. Do not succumb to this. You'll be sorry. This is going to, this is. I mean, I don't, I don't like to use, throw the word bubble around lightly, but six of the eight guys in my multifamily mastermind, and these are high level players, think we're in an absolute bubble that's going to cry, that's going to crash. And the people who are out there proclaiming to be, you know, the, the, the deal maker of, of the century that's, that putting this beautiful pitch deck in front of people. I've seen some absolute garbage deals on beautiful pitch decks lately. And I mean, they're, they're multifamily. They're claiming value add, but their value add is they're sitting back hoping like hell that rent increases will continue at the same rate they have with no other operational efficiencies plan. And that is, that's a fool's errand if I've ever seen one. Absolutely. The, the, the investors going into those deals are going to lose their ass and they'll be trapped in that deal for a decade probably. So it's going to be, it's yeah. going to be awkward and painful. The relationship is likely to break apart between the sponsors and the investors. This is where lawsuits start when, when there's blood in the street. So it's make sure you're investing with the right people. You underwrite people first, assets next. AJ is a great example of that too. I mean, you couldn't meet a better guy and look at his track record. 
How many times has he ever gone back to an investor with egg on his face? None. Probably never. No, he doesn't have to. So well, we're running short on time, but Paul, let's go back to the question. So for someone who's listening to this, that, that, you know, they're like, well, I'm not accredited. I don't know if my buyers are or not like for that residential real estate professional, whether they're flipping houses right now, we just scared the shit out of them because they're like, oh my God, if they raise rates and prices are going to correct, what if I have it? Like for those people, if they're looking how to move into investments more like, like you and I invest in, what would you say to the person who is not accredited and also to their buyers who are not accredited versus the ones who already meet accreditation standards? Yeah. And let's define that to um, them and their buyers. Yeah. So accredited is just a term. It's not something that you would, like you might say, I've never been accredited. Well, you may be accredited and not know it. It's basically 200,000 in individual income, 300,000 if you file jointly, and that's over a couple of years, I'm, you know, per year for a couple of years, or a million dollars in net worth, not counting your home. That's the quick definition of accredited. If you're accredited, you have all kinds of opportunities to make or lose money with these syndications and funds. And the, the world is honestly much more opened up to you to be able to do, you know, these passive investments. If you're not accredited and Chad, you know, I love you, man, but we can have a fight here because we, we could argue over this one because I haven't run this by you yet. But I was in Belize and I ran into a guy who really impressed me and he was a General Motors engineer and he's 50 years old, more or less. And his goal was to get out of General Motors in about three or four years. So he started buying vacation cabins in your favorite, your former favorite place, Gatlinburg. Now, Gatlinburg's interesting because they lost, I think it was 1900, right? Cabins and homes during the, uh, in condos during the big fire about five years ago. And that supply and demand is still out of whack. And so he was telling me how he did this. And I had dinner with him at my house two weeks ago. And he was showing me, this makes total sense. He said, you get a 90% loan. Now that scares me. But anyway, getting a 90% loan as a non-resident of Gatlinburg on your vacation cabin, and you put 10% down. So you put down, let's say 70,000 cash and buy a $700,000 house, or let's just round up. You put a hundred down and get a million dollar cabin. And he said, that thing can cash flow on Airbnb and VRBO 60 to 90,000 a year. Now I did the math on that. That's like a 60 to 90% cash on cash return. If you believe your leverage isn't too risky. And he said that the appreciation there is, I mean, because it's becoming known on airdna.co, you know, as a great location, it, it, it works really well. And I met a guy in bigger pockets at the bigger pockets conference in Asheville doing the same thing, building ground up tiny little cabins and making a fortune as far as cash on cash return. So I think that's a place to steer people. And if you want to meet my engineer friend, by the way, he quit his job in 10 months after buying three of these Gatlinburg cabins. And now he's, he calculates and steers people into the right cabins. He's an expert at it. I just realized there's a lot, we, there's stuff we haven't talked about. You, you were in the middle of a capital raise, but we, I ended up forming an investment club and one of the members who I still want to introduce you to, he's a friend of mine I met in 07 when I was in brokerage in the Smoky Mountains. So Jay has three cabins in, in Gatlinburg. He builds them for around 800,000 all in like yeah. high, high level, large square footage. They'll appraise at 1.4, 1.5. So he yep. gets no more, no more than an ADL TV cash out refi on it. And, uh, he has three cabins and his net operating income for the, for the last 12 months. And this is just, I just asked him this two or three weeks ago. I'm like, just look back through and, and, and in the last 12 months, he has netted $480,000 off of three cabins. What? That's even more. Wow. So. Does he have a pool will, in the basement? Yeah. He does? Yeah. My friend just told me that is a key to massively so increase does, your income. He'll do, a swim, he'll do a heated swimming pool with a hot tub, a big fireplace, and like a, I don't know, probably a 16-foot projector screen. Um, he does foosball tables, pool tables, yeah. uh, putting, like putt-putt golf courses. Uh, like private. All that for 800000 He can furnish that for under fifty grand. With, with that level of FF&E because so he negotiates, he negotiates so, everything. 
So we're in agreement on this. We are. I, I believe that they trade more like commercial assets. The reason I ended up working in Smoky Mountain Market I was selling condos at Snowshoe, the ski resort. I moved to the Smoky Mountains because in 2007, when, when the canary fell over in the cage, I wasn't economically smart enough to talk about it the way I am now, or I think I am, but I knew something wasn't right. So I would move to the Smoky Mountains because I viewed that as a commercial real estate market with a short-term rental facade. And we built Wilderness of the Smokies. The retail pre-construction asking price, that was a 12.3 cap. And brand new construction, all of your, really? your, your rental management fee covered all of your reserves, wow. FF and E, re remodeling, everything was built into a reserve fund. Amazing. So we, we, we thought we were selling like a 12.3 cap new construction condo. Who the hell's ever heard of that? What it actually ended up being is more like a 16 or 18 cap. And Man. the buyers that I brought from Snowshoe, Northern Virginia, you know, they were invested in, in the DC market and Snowshoe. The ones I sold those condos to in the Smokies in 2007, they closed in 2008 when everyone said they were fools. They kept their portfolio together because their Smoky Mountain project or pro yep. property actually subsidized everything else they own. And, and at least two of my clients' cases, it saved their primary residence. Had really? they not made that decision, they would have lost their homes because yeah. they got laid, laid off. So anyways, I'm in agreement. Like it's, it's, there are certainly opportunities. I think short-term rental is a great opportunity in, in a few locations. And I think Gatlinburg is definitely one of those. So you definitely got to get the right realtor there. I've heard that most of them don't really analyze those deals. Well, there's That's one in like my, in my opinion, there's one broker, the guy that I'm referencing, if anyone ever needs to buy an asset in that market, I will, I'll put him up against anybody. He's more like a registered investment advisor of, of Gatlinburg wow. real estate. Nice. So he views, he views his role as a financial fiduciary and he will not let you buy something that doesn't have a high return because why? Nice. Um, yeah. He, one of his clients on who I know he has helped him over the last probably 18 months, he developed 12 cabins and he develops in, with cash and then does cash out refi. Tremendous. And, I mean, like just unbelievable returns on them. Yeah. So, uh, can I make one more comment about that? Sure. So how do you, in, in summary, I'm asking, how do you keep that from being a distraction? I just talked about not chasing two rabbits. I just talked about this not being a distraction. How does somebody like, give me a one minute overview, Chad. How does someone keep that Airbnb and VRBO from not being a distraction? Cause that's really good money for accredited or non-accredited people. Yeah, it is. I'll tell you for me, like, and this is something you and I share, like that struggle of focus, uh, because yeah. we have such a, an amazing network of people and, and just a constant barrage of opportunities for me it was having a thesis right like what kind of man do i want to be in 10 years and acting accordingly today so i don't want to be busy i don't want urgency in my life i don't want drama i don't want operational tedium and all the little mm -hmm. pieces all the things mm -hmm. that you have to do what I do want is to, this map behind me is representative. So I, I want to teach people. I want to, I want to help people learn and, and from what I have. I want to touch lives and improve lives. And I want to travel. And for me, having short-term rentals that require you to be there once, twice, even four times a year, it doesn't fit my thesis. My thesis is work less, earn more, do good. And I invest in things that don't threaten that. So for me, Wellings Capital was a smart move because I know that I, I would trust you with my personal checking account or my, my personal estate, and I don't have to talk to you about it. I don't have to bother you about it. I don't have to worry about it. I know that, that, that it's, it's coming back in multiples. I'm invested in Bitcoin mines. Same yeah. thing. It's a commercial real estate play. We just sell Bitcoin instead of residential space. Like we, right. we just capitalize on, on something else. It's like an industrial commercial play. And so the thing that I choose to invest in, like it is attractive and it is hard. I, a friend of mine bought a house in Virginia beach last week. It's a million dollar house. He's making 15,000 a month. What's his debt service Four, maybe. So he's netting like 12 grand a month and he gets to live in his dream home on the beach. There you go. So 
yeah, it's attractive, but I, every time I get down to it, I'm like, yep, but that threatens the lifestyle that I want to live or, or the other impact that I said I wanted to have. So having an investment thesis is what's kept me in my lane since 2016. And it's kept me from investment, like doing all kinds of crazy things. Mm -hmm. It's pushed me mainly. I'm one of those guys like a dentist or a doctor, not because I work a hundred hours a week, but because I want, I don't want to work a hundred hours a week. Like for me, I'm a passive investor. If you handed me an apartment building and said, you can have this operational mess. All you have to do is spend the next six months of your life dealing with contractors, dealing with courts, kicking out tenants, pulling heroin needles out of the elbows of the plumbing, like dealing with rats and mold and all this infestation and all this horse shit comes with it. That's all you have to do. And for the next 30 years of your life, you can enjoy this passive income. That's a deal that I now know that Chad says no to, because I know that it, for six months of my life, I go against my own principles, against everything that I want, and I just won't do the deal. Good and also I'm blessed with friends who enjoy doing that shit. <laughs> like, yeah, here. that's right, man. I just wrote, so I just wrote an article uh, for bigger pockets. I don't know what the title will be when it comes out. Cause they changed the title, but it was why I passed on a 60% ROI deal. And that was basically, I came to the same conclusion that my life, look, there's that study out there and I don't know what number you ended up like when you see the version of the study, but you know, they say that if you make over 65, some people say 75, some people say 95, if you make over 95,000 a year, whether it's a hundred thousand or a hundred million, you won't be any happier. So if I can't be any happier by adding that, you know, that extra bolt on distraction, why do it? You know what? I mean, if I'm already making over that threshold, well, to me, that that rel that that dawned on me when I was about to pull the trigger on one of those type of distractions. And I said, you know what? I think I'll just go rent in Gatlinburg or Virginia Beach or Asheville and let someone else have that, even if it's only an hour a week, that hour a week distraction. Yep. So that's for me. Now, for you guys listening, Paul's on a, we've got a, a hard stop that we're coming up against. Paul, tell them where they can find information on your fund and where also they could look. We, 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 we're really good at finding rabbit holes. Um, but if Ooh, someone maybe. has, if they have clients and they want to push them yeah. to the more passive side of investing, where, where can they find you learn more about Wellings? Yeah, I'm going to answer that with a, a two-part answer. First of all, I want to mention, if you don't know about human trafficking, Wellings Capital is really getting involved and I'm looking at my life, you know, and I, and I, I, I want to leave an impact. I want to make a mark on history. You know, I don't know how long I'll be around. I'm expecting to be around 43 more years and two months. Cause I expect to live to a hundred, but you know, you never know. And so I am really try I, I don't know chad if you've heard this but if you took the record profits the record profits of apple general motors nike and starbucks added those up tripled that number that's the estimated revenues generated by human trafficking every year chad since we started this conversation a couple hundred people about 200 to 250 have been trapped or ensnared into human or sold into human trafficking, into slavery. And I'd like to believe if I was alive in the 1800s, I would be fighting slavery. I'd be an abolitionist. Or if I was an adult in the 1960s, that I'd be fighting for, you know, good civil rights. Well, this is a civil right. It is slavery and it's happening under our noses. And so I want to be part of fighting that. And so Wellings Capital is taking some steps and we're about to make some announcements about how we're going to continue to fight human trafficking and rescue its victims. You can reach us at wellingscapital.com. And if you want to get a special report on mobile home park investing, self-storage investing, or just a simple five-day course on how to get into commercial real estate investing in general, then you can go to wellingscapital.com slash resources. And that will get you there. Oh, socials. Can they find you on LinkedIn? Follow you, you on bigger, on... bigger pockets yeah. is probably LinkedIn, a great place. Bigger pockets. You know, uh, I, I'm occasionally on places like Facebook or MySpace or whatever. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's a joke, but seriously, yeah, I'm getting more involved in the social media side, but wellingscapital.com is the best place to reach me. That's 
we consistently know that we will be answering your emails within hours. Well, Paul, thank you so much for letting us all borrow your experience and your wisdom. And uh, we hope to have you back soon. Thanks. For Thanks, your time. my friend. Great to see you.